Well, Prananda, uh, but uh, good afternoon, everybody. And can I start with an apology? Uh, this is not my rather poor Mar Mariella Fostrop impression, but it's actually <laughs> a very uh, uh, early uh, dose of Fresh's flu uh, that I'm suffering from this week. So uh, please forgive me. Um, Colin, thank you so much uh, for those kind words of introduction. And thank you to you and your colleagues here at Cardiff University for hosting the uh, event today. Uh, thanks also go to, to Ben and Geraint and Jesse, some of Cardiff's PhD students who I uh, met earlier. It's fantastic to hear uh, about, your, uh, about your work and I wish you uh, the very best of luck in your future uh, endeavours. As I said, it's great to be able to join you here this afternoon, especially here at the Postgraduate Teaching Centre, where professionals from industry and master students mix and study together in what is a great location. It's a real state-of-the-art facility. I understand you have a simulated trading of floor here, and uh, the facilities are ones that reflect the ambitions to engage strongly with both the local and the global economy. Now, one of Cardiff University's main purposes is to contribute to the social, cultural and economic development of Wales. It says so in the University Charter, so it must be true. And that civic ambition, in common with our other universities, was the product of a national, political and educational awakening. As the Aberdeen Committee of 1881 noted, there was a widespread desire for a better education system in Wales in the second half of the 19th century. And the establishment of our own university colleges was central to the fulfillment of that desire. I know that ambitions for an even better education system in Wales are shared, indeed they are demanded across the country even now. And our national mission is to ensure that all citizens benefit from an equal opportunity to reach the highest standards. I am ambitious and optimistic about our collective ability to shape a system that is modern, excellent and innovative. And universities are critical to that national mission. They should be open and outward looking, connecting the civic, social and the economic. And I want to take the opportunity that I have this afternoon to share some of the thoughts that I have on the roles of universities as civic institutions. The challenge and necessity of civic engagement following the EU referendum. The role of universities as stewards of community, city and country. And the importance of innovation, a start-up culture and international links. However, just before I move on, I would like to take the opportunity to congratulate the sector in Wales for achieving its highest ever student satisfaction level in the National Student Survey last month, outperforming England, in fact. You know, and although I don't and we don't take the narrow view of students as simply a set of consumers, delivering the very best possible student experience is a fundamental priority, so congratulations to all. Now, I'm sure that all in this room would also agree that the UK withdrawal from the European Union brings significant challenges for our universities. The Vice-Chancellor of this institution has himself described the current position as one of turbulence and uncertainty that many of us have not experienced in our lifetime. And it's difficult, Colin, to argue with that analysis. But those challenges ahead of us are to be embraced rather than avoided, because there is no other option. Of course, uh, we have to be realistic, and I recognise that there will be forces and powers beyond our direct control. But as a progressive, as an optimist, and let's face it, you've got to be if you're a Liberal Democrat, I believe in our collective ability to find the solutions, make the big cause and shape a post-Brexit higher education system that is open, open, confident and innovative. As Tom Kibasi, director of the IPPR, recently wrote on the necessity of political optimism and responding to our environment, the crucial point is not, is it good or bad, but how do we act together to make sure that our society benefits from all its potential 
rather than suffers from its potential risks. And in that spirit, working with Universities Wales and with HEFCU and the Welsh Higher Education Brussels Board, my officials will be holding for the first time this month a meeting of the Welsh HE Brexit Working Group. It will actively coordinate intelligence and provide advice on both the impact and the possibilities of UK withdrawal from the EU. And in establishing the group, I also want to set a challenge to the sector and to all interested parties. The government wants to work with you on innovations in international engagement to look at new models and markets and how best to secure those partnerships, research and funding relationships with EU colleagues. Now, Wales already punches above its weight compared to the rest of the UK in transnational education programmes with China, for example. And working together through the Global Wales Partnership, we continue to increase promotion and opportunities in key markets. The First Minister is this week in the United States, making the case for deeper and stronger engagement. And as someone who spent part of their own degree studying at the University of Missouri, I'm delighted that the sector has identified untapped potential for Wales in the North American market. We will also be pressing the UK government to think creatively for a genuine four nations approach to successor funding arrangements, but also to offer to pilot new approaches within a reformed immigration system. I was disappointed, well, to say the least, I was disappointed, that the recent post-study work visa pilot is limited to four universities in English cities, decided without any consultation with any of the non-English governments. I have mm -hmm. made this point to the Home Office and I am determined to engage on behalf of Wales ahead of any potential expansion. I'm also looking to the sector, working with the private sector to come forward with proposals on encouraging more of our students to spend time studying and gaining work experience abroad, both in Europe and further afield. And on that note, I'm pleased to confirm that we are continuing to fund the Generation UK China programme and we will be looking for other models. But above all, I want to reiterate that staff and students from across the European Union are welcome at our universities. As a Liberal, I continue to believe in an open and tolerant Wales, which has long benefited from immigration from across the world. Our higher education sector thrives because of the diversity and the dynamism of all its people. Over a 1,000 students from the EU and across the world will be joining us in Wales over the next month, and I want them to know that their contribution to life here is and will be very much appreciated. And Wales.com will also be leading a global campaign during October to promote Wales as a destination for international students. I'd like to take the opportunity now to reflect a little on the referendum result and the opportunities and responsibilities for universities. Writing in the Times, Heder Times Higher Education, Dr Claire Taylor of uh, our own Glyndor University has described the sector's feelings of shock that expert views from universities were roundly ignored by politicians and the public. She argues that following a period of wound licking, universities must recapture a notion of community that connects campus, country, and the global context. I welcome both the prescription for next steps, but also such a constructive reflection on the sector's role within and the reaction to the referendum result. In fact, I would go further. At a UK level, the pro-EU campaign of universities was too easily dismissed as one of self-interest and almost exclusively focused on income. Now, this is not to exempt politicians and governments from criticism. Far from it. As Anthony Barnett has put it, we have an obligation across our four nations to regroup as a meaningful democracy, socially inclusive, internationally responsible 
and economically fair and institutionally inventive. But it is certainly incumbent upon universities to reflect on the different distance between campus and community exposed by the referendum the result of the results. The urgency of now is to recapture a civic mission. It is a challenge that should engage hearts and minds, and universities are nothing if they are not places to challenge minds. As a progressive, I have a nagging concern following the referendum result. The victories that have helped us blend the arc of history towards progress, feminism, opening up access to education, civility in our discourse and towards one another, civil rights, even devolution, may be much more fragile than we could have ever have imagined. <clears throat> the vote showed that when people and communities think that advancements are for the benefit of others, rather than for them or their families or society at large, they will think that they have nothing, nothing to lose by standing against them. Are we confident that the communities that host our universities do not see those institutions as belonging to other people? How are Welsh universities owned, rooted and responsible to their region on the nation? How will they address issues of social cohesion, active citizenship and informed debates in the months and the years to come? These are contemporary challenges but also a call to recapture the spirit of our national education mission. As I said at the start, our universities owe their very first steps to an education revolution of civic, economic and academic ambition. It was the pence of the poor that funded those first steps, with the pounds of philanthropists and governments a step behind. Even here, in Cardiff, efforts at the turn of the century to fund a Department of Commerce failed, with only £15 being raised from the sector. Now, of course, links with industry are much stronger now, but there is still much, much more that we can do. Universities, much like the Mutual Improvement Societies and the Miners' Libraries, they were of the people, for the people. Gareth Elwyn Jones described it as a culture of altruism, a coalition of miners, quarry workers, chapel goers, immigrants, workers from all sectors, funding scholarships and colleges, advancing individuals, communities and the nation, all driving, all focused on what Raymond Williams would describe as the project for an engaged and participating democracy. Now, these actions and ambitions came in lieu of distant, centralised states, and universities grew as autonomous institutions with academic freedom. And that is a principle that remains secure. But the task now is a Welsh higher education system that is accessible and relevant to its home communities with a within a democratic, devolved nation. And to combine it with an openness to students, scholars, opportunities and intellectual developments in Europe and across the world. Our universities should be the source of robust thinking and free debate, taking their place in the public square rather than retrenching behind institutional walls. And I want to see universities engaged in debates and ideas built on evidence from research, like the research I heard about earlier, and careful thought. Arguments about institutional funding are important. I understand that. But they must not be the sole focus of intellectual and policy discussion. As part of that approach, our university should look to the example of those founded in the United States as land-grant universities. Those colleges founded in the 19th century when public land was given over to higher education provision aimed at the working classes, they have recaptured their mission as stewards of place. This both reflects the mutually beneficial relationship with their host community, but an ongoing commitment to civic engagement and leadership. The referendum showed that our notions of togetherness and bonds between communities are perhaps much, much weaker than we had imagined. Welsh universities, the civic and international institutions, 
have a responsibility as stewards of community, city and country. Accessibility and relevance to community and country can take many forms and there is much good work already, not uh, least in the provision of part-time opportunities for study, which I am very keen during my period of office to see prosper. But there is much more to do on connecting campus and higher education more widely with our communities. And I don't see that to be contradictory to the international ambitions of the sector. Done well, it should be complementary. Indeed, the study of Wales, our history, culture, politics, economy, should be both for our own citizens and the wider world. And the recent, recent launch of the OU and Wales' Haven website is an innovative example in this area. The global outlook for our university should bring benefits for student and graduate experience, region to region working, transnational industry links, research and development, and strengthen civic and people to people exchanges. But I am clear that on top of all of that, our universities must be of their place and of their people as a first principle. And it is from this stewardship that universities will fulfil their national, civic and international roles and responsibilities. Now, the best of Wales is a tradition of self-improvement, democratising knowledge and educational leadership. Our education reforms at all levels takes inspiration from those values. Working together, we will get the basics right raise our standards and ambitions for excellence for all pupils, parents, students and teachers. It is not only schools and teachers that must deepen and extend collaboration and mutual improvement. Our universities must also deliver that national mission, working with schools, industries and international partners. Now, I recognise that there have been positive developments in universities working with schools to share their expertise in areas such as modern foreign languages and digital competency, led by Cardiff, but also including Swansea, Bangor and Aberystwyth, a pilot undergraduate mentoring scheme is helping inspire pupils to study languages at school. We have a long way to go, but the pilot is a collaborative and innovative approach to addressing the issue of poor take-up of MFL. Swansea's innovative use of computer science undergraduate students as teaching support in local schools and running techno club sessions is also a very, very welcome development. Those links between universities and schools are critical to a civic mission as, of course, is universities' more traditional, perhaps, outreach work that promotes aspiration and attainment in all our communities. You know, I take great pride in being an education secretary that has responsibilities for both sectors, schools and universities. And we should welcome England's recent conversion to our model of working, bringing higher education alongside schools in the Department for Education. And of course, we must not forget, universities have a direct role as teacher education centres. And John Furlong's report is critical in reforming our teacher training courses and developing the skills teachers want and need linked to a clear focus on leadership and standards. Professor Furlong's report also identifies that not a single academic from any teaching education centre in Wales was returned for the most recent Research Excellent Framework. And frankly, that <coughs> is not good enough. To go further, only 1.5% of total UK submissions in specialised educational research was from Wales, and all of them came from Cardiff. If researchers and academics in Wales aren't engaging with education reform here, we can't rely on any other universities to do it for us. You know, I'm not asking for Welsh universities to be cheerleaders for Welsh education policy, but a greater sense of inquiry and interest in our educational environment here in Wales post-devolution is a must. If I move on, 
the New York University expert on the social and economic effects of technology, Clay Shirky, has said that the biggest threat to those working in colleges and universities isn't video, video lectures or online tests. It's the fact that we live in institutions perfectly adapted to an environment that no longer exists. Now, he was writing in the context of elite American colleges and their inflex inflexibility in widening access and democratising value as a public good and measuring graduate outcomes. Here in Wales, we can indeed debate all of those things, but more pressingly, the sector needs to be ready for the post-Brexit environment. It will require collaboration, connecting the civic, social, academic and economic. As I set out in my agreement with the First Minister, I am very keen to promote a culture of innovation and entrepreneurship in our universities in partnership with the public and private sectors. Now, the work of Nesta provides evidence on innovation driving prosperity in smaller, nimbler countries, whether that's Estonia's development of technology across a range of public services, to Singapore's encouragement of, the, of SME innovation, and the Basque country's commitment to collaborative innovation rooted in a sense of identity and ambition. Now, these countries share virtues described by the American economist Tyler Cohen as start-up nations. Strong identities and a vision, a commitment to innovation, and an important national role for universities, and a scale where nations can act together. You know, I'm old enough to remember that we had a little bit of that optimism here in 1999. And let's be honest, it's been a mixed record. However, although post-Brexit we will not be a new nation, our new environment does necessitate a start-up mentality. Now, the higher education sector was perhaps too slow to adapt in the first decade of devolution, too slow to recognise its new devolved democratic environment. We need to work in a new partnership to embrace the challenges ahead with the energy and the enterprise of a start-up. Now, Cardiff was recently recognised as the 45th most innovative university in Europe, which does show that we have the tools here in Wales. This is not beyond us. On my recent visit to the Swansea Bay campus, the work of the Engineering Manufacturing Centre in particular was so, so impressive. But I want to see greater promotion of undergraduate opportunities for social innovation and entrepreneurship. Cardiff Metropolitan Award-winning Centre for Entrepreneurship, alongside projects such as Trinity St David's Creative Bubble in Swansea and Bangor's success in software licensing, are very much to be welcomed. However, only two Welsh universities are currently involved in the Enactus programme, two. This is a global programme which provides social enterprise opportunities for student teams. Unfortunately, neither of the Welsh teams has yet won the UK national competition for students. I want to see more Welsh students to get the opportunity to undertake such entrepreneurial activity at university and at national and indeed an international level. I regret to say that no Welsh university is yet, rec yet recognised as a change maker campus a designation for leading institutions in social innovation education. There are fewer of those, there are only 40, fewer than 40 across the globe, but there are universities from England and Scotland in there, alongside Brown, George Mason and Johns Hopkins universities. I want us to make progress on that here in Wales. Now, the number of act active university startup businesses in Wales has increased by 29% this year. And we are punching above our weight in the UK context, with 12% of the total UK graduate startups and 15% of the UK staff startups. So that is a base on which we can indeed build. Graduates from this university have established more than 270 startup companies in the last three years. These are the foundations for further encouraging enterprise among students, staff and graduates. Now, before concluding, 
I will cover a couple of other priorities from my agreement with the First Minister. I have talked a lot this afternoon about civic responsibility and the relationship between the state, society, student and the sector. The funding of higher education, if it is to be sustainable and progressive, must also share those same characteristics of a social contract. Sir Ian Diamond will soon be presenting his independent cross-party review of higher education funding and student finance. As set out in my agreement with the First Minister, the Government will consider these recommendations with a view to early implementation where appropriate. When the report is published, which will be later this month, I will make a statement that afternoon to the Assembly on the strategic direction and principles of his recommendations. In responding to the review, I am clear that Wales needs a higher education funding settlement that supports students when they need it the most, and also enables our universities to compete internationally. Fear of living costs must not prevent higher education being available to all who could benefit from it. Sir Ian and his cross-party panel of experts, and some of you are here in this room, and I thank you for your work, has been diligent uh, in studying these issues. I am hopeful that we can be optimistic, ambitious and innovative in bringing forward a settlement that will maintain the principle of universalism within a progressive system. For the first time anywhere in the UK, a system that ensures a fair and consistent approach across levels and different modes of study, ensures shared investment between government and those who directly benefit from a higher education, and enhances accessibility, reducing barriers to study, such as living costs. I look forward to working with the sector and others once the report is published and as we develop, develop the government's full response. It's going to be a very busy term. My agreement with the First Minister also committed to consulting further on the specific recommendations of the Hazelcorn Review. Now, further information will be published on the Welsh Government's way forward in due course. I do believe that issues of governance at a national level require further examination. We must recognise the imperative for contemporary understanding and a breadth of perspective and experience which meets the needs of learners and employers and the nation. In my agreement with the First Minister, we recognise that high-quality education is the driving force for social mobility, national prosperity and an engaged democracy. Those three pillars of individual advancement and ambition, skills and economic development and an active citizenship and democratic culture are integral to a high-performing education system. Academic and vocational routes into and through further and higher education should be open to all learners of all ages. To achieve this, universities must be connected to their communities and country, and of course to the economy in which they are a key component. As stewards of the community, city and country, universities are critical in shaping the confident international and innovative Wales that must emerge from these most challenging of times. Through research and recruitment, you are a bridge to the wider world. Now, those bridges, I know, currently cross some very choppy waters, and government will work with you to keep those bonds strong. But you must also draw strength from impact, influence, and innovation at home. I ask you here today to recapture and reinvent that civic mission, realised and relevant for the contemporary challenges. And I am confident in your imagination and innovation to meet that test, to seize the opportunities and the responsibilities that lie ahead. Thank you.